Hi everybody, this is Rizwan Chaudhry and you are listening to the Phil Finish podcast sponsored by Abiject, the show that shares expertise in all aspects of injectables, vaccines and aseptic Phil Finish. And today we are speaking with Philip Leslie, the Acting Head of Manufacturing at Abiject. And today's topic is Temperature Sensitive Biologics and BFS. So thanks for joining me, Philip. Before we start, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Currently, I'm working with Apigex as a consultant with the manufacturing side of the process. I've worked for over 30 years in the pharmaceutical business, mostly with Blowfill Seal for various pharmaceutical companies around the world. And I've really enjoyed the use of Blowfill Seal and the opportunities it provides for pharmaceuticals for the world. And can you tell us a bit more about Abject itself and their experience within Blowfill Seal? Yeah, so Apiject is a device technology company and it's very much in the startup phase and we're looking to develop a range of devices that enhance the delivery of pharmaceuticals to patients using the Blowfill Seal technology, which has a number of advantages over conventional processes. I understand you led a team that launched the first commercial vaccine into Blowfill Seal. So before we talk about how that came about, for those people who are listening who are not familiar with BFS and Blowfield Seal, could you describe what BFS actually is? Yeah, sure. So Blowfield Seal is an innovative packaging process where, as the name suggests, it blow molds a polymer into a bottle. And after the bottle is formed, the filling process, the needles come down and fill the product into the preformed bottle. And then the needles retract and the final seal process seals the bottle into a hematically sealed product. This process is relatively quick, all done within a few seconds and done very well in terms of its aseptic quality. Going back to that launch of the first commercial vaccine into Blowfield, so how did that come about? So I was working for a previous company before Apigec. We were mostly making respiratory products. We were looking as a business plan to move into more higher value products like vaccines, which would be more challenging to make and more value adding than a commodity product like a respiratory product. And we were fortunate that the vaccine division of the company was also having some challenges with a product. They wanted to change the packaging process and also have the packaging that would also be the delivery device as well. The challenge, of course, with Blowfill Seal was the fact that people were cautious that the hot polymer would possibly degrade the vaccine. This is why it hadn't really been challenged before. So how did you go about solving that particular problem with filling a temperature-sensitive product in BFS? So there are lots of advantages of Blowfill Seal. These include the reduced supply chain. And, you know, where there are only two inputs, there's the polymer and the vaccine. It's a much more economical way to do it than the traditional glass and things like that. So we were keen to try and show that the vaccine wouldn't be degraded by the temperature profile. But being a production facility, we didn't have an R&D facility, but we had a very strong relationship with a local university who had some researchers and could do some benchtop tests for us. The other thing we knew was the temperature profile of the polymer as it goes through the process. So we mapped that out. And what we asked the researchers to do was to simply set up a water bath with the polymer in that water bath at the temperature we knew would be the temperature when the product is dosed into it. So we dosed some water into it, had some thermocouples into the water and mapped the temperature profile as it cooled down. And this showed that the temperature of the product didn't get anywhere near as hot as people expected. That was really promising for us. Right. So what happened next then after you solved that particular problem? So we presented that to the vaccine team and showed that there was a real possibility that we could fill the product into Blowfill Seal without degrading it. And they were quite excited and were interested in doing a real trial with some vaccine. We needed to do quite a bit of work for us to be able to do that. We had a pilot blowfill seal machine at the site, and we then set about working on how best to set that machine up to ensure that we controlled the temperature into the profile that we believe would be that. The next steps for us were to run a sort of design of experiments because we knew there were a huge range of parameters on a blowfill seal machine, like many machines, that you can adjust temperatures and extrusion rates and profiles and things like that. We tried to control some and vary the others. There's a standard experimental design where you put this into a software process and randomize the trials to to understand which parameters are really influencing the final temperature that our temperature of the product was our control. We did this on the machine initially with some water. 
and we built a special way of measuring the temperature with some thermocouples on the fill needles and things like that. That was quite an extensive thermo trial, and it came back that there were a couple of key things that we needed to control, one of which was the wall thickness of the bottle, and the other was the temperature of the liquid that we filled into it. It's not unsurprising that wall thickness was a key factor because it's rather like the bottle. Uh, this is the polymer uh, that has the heat and it's delivering the temperature to the product. So if you can make the wall thickness as thin as possible, you're reducing the heat capacity of the container. It can transfer it. And then, of course, there is obviously a step up with the temperature of the product. If you can put the product in at a low temperature, say two to six degrees, then when it goes up, say, 10, 15, 20 degrees, it's still well within room temperature type things. So they were the two things that we learned out of that experiment. And we then went set about to make sure we could control that and modify the machine to give us those parameters. And then did you then fill the vaccine right away for the trial? The next step, of course, was bringing the vaccine onto the site. And in the pharmaceutical industry, a lot of challenges with dealing with live viral vaccines. So we had to go through a big risk assessment and talking with the regulators and our other quality people to ensure that we didn't contaminate the whole site with a vaccine. That was quite a large piece of work with the disposal and training of staff and things like that. So that went through quite a bit of work. And then, of course, the documentation, uh, both training documents and validation documents and control documents that we had to write, which comes with the pharmaceutical industry to get this right. So that was the setup. And then finally, we ran the trial, which was all over in a day <laughs> after several weeks of planning. And the trial went very well. We felt hopeful that the product was done as best we could. So we had to send it back to Belgium and for them to do the assaying, check that the vaccine survived the process and that waiting started at that point. What processes are involved when you carry out a trial with a vaccine with a blow food seal container? So obviously there's extractable leachables you have to test for and other things as well, I'm sure. What else do you have to do when you're, when you're doing a trial like that with the vaccine? Well, of course, the vaccine group weren't able to provide us with very much in terms of volume. We only had two or three litres of product to trial. So we had to modify a way of putting this into a sort of disposable bag that came aseptically from the manufacturer and connect that to the machine except aseptically and keep that cold. So we had a little portable fridge that did that. Um, so that was the control of the temperature of the product. And then we did some fancy work around changing the fill head so that we controlled the cooling process. So we made sure that we could suck the heat out of the polymer as quickly as possible. And we cooled that. We had that cooling water right down to a very low temperature to suck the heat out of the process. One of the other things we found was, of course, the vaccine was quite viscous. It was a, a very thick liquid. And when we cooled it right down to two to eight, it became almost like uh, golden syrup. So <laughs> filling it, we'd never filled anything that viscous before. So we had to build some new fill needles that we could push out the dose that we wanted in the time that we needed. There was many trials with just placebos as well as finally with the product itself. Right. And you mentioned that obviously you ship the vaccine back to Belgium to ensure yes. that it survived. So did it survive its trip back? And what were the next <laughs> steps then? Yes, it was handled very carefully in a special little box with its own temperature controller flown back to Belgium. And they then tested it in their normal way because they were the experts in testing the product. And yes, it did. It, it showed there was very little degradation of the temperature of the product's potency. But of course, this was the first time point we had to wait for several months to get sort of several other time points to ensure that there wasn't something lurking that would, it would suddenly start to die. But it didn't. It, it matched the normal process that was being used for filling into other containers. So we were very happy then that we felt the blowfill seal could fill vaccines into blowfill seal effectively and not affect their potency. And then from that point on, I mean, what were the next steps then to get to the commercial stage? Yeah, so we, you know, really um, jury rigged it in the factory with various gaffer tapes and different small things and processes to make sure that we could do it. But then to do it commercially, we were obviously changing for a couple of litres up to 600 litres. And we had to develop a process of how we pooled that process and and raise a capital project to do the permanent changes and also to the air conditioning to make sure we had more confined processes in terms of controlling the airflow to make sure that we didn't contaminate, cross-contaminate. We had to build a packaging line and we had to look at leak testing and other processes that were aligned to that process. 
Of course, along with this was the initial requirement of the vaccine team. They wanted to develop a new container that would also be the delivery device. They didn't want, as typically you would have, say you'd have a glass container or something that you would draw it into the container, into a device that you would dose the patient with. They wanted to use the container at the advantages of the soft, low density polyethylene to squeeze it and, and deliver it to the patient in one go. So we designed the device, the shape of the bottle, and made sure that we were actually delivering the dose that they wanted routinely. And they had to do a number of human factor studies with different healthcare professionals and instructions on how to use it. And then this went through various design cycles as we changed the mold slightly to improve its performance. That And that ran in parallel with the building and fit out of the facility that we were doing at the site. Then we were pretty well ready to go and we had our first batch came out and filled that. And yeah, we did three batches in a row to do the traditional three batch validation process. Then they went on to stability as well. It was quite a big project in terms of getting us into the point of being able to make commercial supply. How long did this process actually take then? Best part of a year or so from the the approval of the project to go ahead to when we were ready to make the product. And of course, that didn't include the time because they wanted three and six months stability data. I had to write the registration dossier and submit that to the European Union and auditing by both the TGA, our local authority here in Australia, as well as, you know, the WHO wanted approval and various other local internal things. So there was quite a bit of paperwork done after the facility was finished. So from your perspective, what do you think were the key learnings from doing that particular project? Well, I think the key thing for us was to assemble the right team. Fortunately, we've been making Blowfill Seal and doing some development work for a number of years. So we had a team of experts who knew the quality side, the plumbing and the processing side and the control of the machine and how we ran it. And that team really was the key part of that. Also, a key process around problem solving. If you have a problem doing the root cause and trying to find what the root cause of it was so that it didn't happen again and using a good scientific method in that process. So we documented that. Finally, really trying to write very good procedures because really creating training modules and people who were experienced and knew how to, you know, know which knobs made the big, the big difference and what to do when things started to change so we could control the process in, in a very good way. So they were the key things that we learned. And of course, you know, the whole real belief that, that we could do it and nobody done it before in a big scale. And it was exciting and there was a great support from the whole site. We were a relatively small team of 10 or 15 people in the time. But yes, it was a, an exciting time when you do something like that for the first time. Well, listen to you talk about the trial itself when you first did it with a small sample of vaccine. It struck me how you had to be very adaptable. And obviously, like you said, creating a new needle so that you could uh, inject and things like that in terms of using different materials that perhaps you weren't expecting to. Yes, absolutely. I mean, the interesting thing with the needle was, of course, if the machine stopped, the temperature of the liquid increased and the viscosity reduced. So when you started up, instead of getting a couple of mil, you got, you know, 15 mil and it went all over the floor and everything. So you had to adjust. That was the learning of how to control the machine if you stopped it or you started it or what to do with the different parts of it. And having people able to understand the process itself, a deep understanding of the process was, was key to be the success of it, yes. Okay. Teamwork okay. is it is always the way, isn't it? The right well, yeah. As they say, teamwork makes a dream work. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yes. So what do you think about the future of filling temperature sensitive products into BFS? Well, I think we've just scratched the surface. I'm, I know I'm biased, <laughs> but I think there's a huge opportunity here. I think we've seen paradigm shifts in many things in the past decade, and I think there's going to be a paradigm shift away from traditional glass bottles into blow fill seal because it's a better aseptic process. Particles are almost non-existent in it, and it's faster, it's cheaper, it is a better quality process. So I think um, the ability to use the blow fill seal container as a delivery device whether you want to put a needle on it or whether you want to be able to squirt it into a mouth of a patient or squirt it onto the skin and spread it around or do that sort of thing, you know, or mix it up in a dual chamber. You know, Apiject is really looking at a range of different devices that could enhance the delivery and the efficacy of products going forward. So I think there's a great opportunity for us in the industry to convert to blow fill seal. Philip, 
as always, it's always a pleasure speaking to you. And I always learn something new when I get to talk to you. So I appreciate you taking the time out to talk to me today. There you go, listeners. If you'd like to know more, you can find out more about Abject and what they do and the different solutions they offer at www.abject.com. And to learn more about the Phil Finish podcast or to suggest a topic, visit philfinishpodcast.com. So, Philip, thank you very much for your time. It's lovely speaking to you and hopefully we can catch up again soon. And listeners, thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed that. And until next time, goodbye. Appyject is advancing Phil Finish technology to serve the world. We are bringing together blow fill seal and injection molding technology so that pharmaceuticals and vaccines can be fill finished in single dose pre-filled injectors at any scale. Copyright Appyject. All rights reserved. The views, thoughts, and opinions expressed in the podcast belong solely to the speaker and do not necessarily reflect the views, thoughts, and opinions of the host, sponsor, speaker's employer, or any other organization or individual mentioned.